Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to the third plenary session of this exhaustive, massive uh, AID conference. I hope you have a little bit of energy left uh, for this uh, session. Um, we will try to make it as interactive and exciting as possible. Um, the topic for this uh, session is redefining citizenship in contemporary development discourse. <coughs> and we have a, an interesting mix and set of, uh, of speakers, as you can see uh, on the screen. If you compare the list on the screen with the list in your program, there is one person unfortunately uh, missing, that is Professor Ghosh from, uh, from India. Um, so we have four uh, speakers here. I will introduce them, give them each uh, six, seven, or perhaps eight minutes to introduce their one or two main points in relation to the topic. Then I will most likely ask them one or two follow-up uh, questions, and then we open it up in two ways. As you can see on the screen, I hope, yeah, there is an opportunity for you to tweet your questions to the hashtag that is mentioned there. And I have been promised that somebody will collect these questions from Twitter and then deliver them to me so that I can um, use them. And we will also do it in the old-fashioned traditional way that most of us are used to, which is that by then you can raise your hand and I will ask somebody to give you a microphone. Um, so that is also still on, um, <laughs> especially for Jean-Luc, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, now the topic of today, redefining citizenship in contemporary development discourse. Um, we have four speakers to start more from an economic perspective to emphasize more the political dimensions of, of this uh, debate. And I will brief, very briefly introduce them to you on my left, uh, Nancy Bertzel, who is the president of the Center for Global Development. Uh, many of you will have um, listened to her speak uh, yesterday uh, evening. Uh, today she will start with an introduction that is not a recap of yesterday's lecture, but that will actually try to connect the topic that she discussed yesterday, which was more middle classes, to the topic of what does that mean for citizenship. Um, Next to her on, on my left is uh, uh, Francisco Pereira, who is the chief economist for the Africa region uh, at the World Bank. Then here on my right is uh, Olivier Consolo, who is, um, according to the program, the former director of the European NGO Confederation for Relief and Development, Concord. Um, and because I found it a bit unsatisfactory to introduce somebody just by what they did in earlier days, I also looked at his web page, and that says that he is a freelance activist focusing on the <coughs> links between local struggles, social and political innovations, and the international agenda. Um, and then on the far right from me, on the left for you, is Adrian Gurza Laval, who is Associate Professor, Political Science Department of Sao Paulo uh, University. The uh, sequence of the speakers is that Nancy will start, um, Francisco will go second, Adrian will go third, and Olivier will be the fourth one in the first uh, iteration. Can I give the floor, please, to Nancy? Thank you very much, Peter. What I'd like to do is say a little bit about the concept of a global citizen, how that's connected to the supply and the demand for global governance. So the supply and the demand gives you a hint that I'll try to be talking as an economist, but not too much so, um, as I hope you'll see. Let me start with the dark side uh, of the global crisis. I think what happened <coughs> with the 2008 crisis is there was a loss of faith including in the rich world, in markets. There was also a loss of faith in democratic government's ability to manage markets in a way that was fair and just. We heard from uh, Luca Cazzelli yesterday, you know, the idea that 
the markets and the politics have both been captured by a global elite. We've sort of gone from a world of a, an establishment seen as responsible to a world that feels like there's a 1% elite that's grabbing all the economic and political rents so that globalization and global markets uh, are not fair. So we have in the rich world the rise amongst the middle classes of a lot of frustration, a lot of fear, and in some countries in Europe in particular, well, in the U.S. too, we have the Tea Party, and in Europe you have this sense of the rise of right-wing extremism, which is very worrying, of course. In the development community, there's kind of the same, a mirror of the same sense on the dark side, which is that the global system is not fair. It's not just within countries, including middle-class societies, that things are going wrong, but the system is not fair. <coughs> we have seen the global market play a big role in delivering at least two billion people out of poverty in uh, the developing world. Last night, I tried to talk about the distinction between the group of people who have escaped poverty and those who are in the true middle class. And some of you who were there may remember that I referred to Chico Ferreira, who led a report at the World Bank on Latin America's middle class, where a distinction was made between those who are poor in the extreme or moderate sense, and then a group in Latin America between four and ten dollars that I like to call the strugglers or the strivers. And we're in a system, this is the sense in the global community I think, where there are three to four billion people in the world who are in this struggling group. And they are people who live very fragile, insecure lives. They are people who are taxed through their consumption rather heavily, actually, in Latin America anyway, in part because it's easier to tax their consumption than it is to tax property and ca income from capital of the rich. And that has something to do with the mobility of capital in the world compared to the mobility of labor. So it's part of a global system which, again, feels unfair. So that's the dark side. And I tried to bring in a little bit about this issue that in developing countries and the development challenge is now as much about whether the strugglers will move into the middle class or not. Whether they will be, they will have access to equal opportunities and so on or whether they will be victims both in their countries and at the global level of a system that isn't working well. That's the dark side. The bright side, there's a bright side too, however, and here I want to say demand from global citizens, citizen activism. Uh, I did a paper last year for a group called, a new group, the Global Citizen Foundation that's based in Geneva on this issue of global governance, demand and supply. On the demand side, there has been an unbelievable increase I think mostly from middle class citizens who are globally aware, including in low and middle income countries, some of whom are here at this conference, as well as middle class professionals <coughs> in the development community. There's been a big increase in citizen activism, four and five fold increase in the number of NGOs that are registered with the United Nations in Asia and Africa and where there were more already in Latin America in the last 10 or 15 years, more than a doubling. Also from world value surveys, if people are asked, how do you feel as a citizen, and they're not forced to choose between a citizen of their country and a citizen of the world, a surprising number of people all over the world say they feel like a global or a world citizen. And that is more true of people in developing countries with more education, the more they have, and the younger they are. 
So if we assume that that trend continues with people having more education and the young people feeling that way, we have a sense that out there there's this huge rise in activist, activism and demand for sort of bending, to use Martin Luther King's expression, the benefits of globalization more toward the poor and the strugglers. And it's coming from the middle class in the developing world. I love the story because there are also mixed coalitions of governments, international institutions, NGOs, business. I love the story of what happened with uh, the fight for reducing the price of AIDS drugs. What happened was that a global citizen movement worked with, through and with, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, using those international institutions of global governance as vehicles to press their demand for a change in what was in effect the US government's approach to intellectual property, where the US government was under pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. So you have a sort of mixed coalition of people that made a big change in global rules. And then you have the international women's movement, which is about a big change that's taken place, especially in the last 20 years, in the norms at the global level that most globally aware citizens would honor. The problem we have in the challenge in the development community, I think, is on the supply side. What do we have? We don't have the, um, the equivalent to the state, or the sovereign, that provides a domestic social contract. We have the World Bank, we have the United Nations, we have the IMF, but we also have a sense that they are weak often and ineffective, and more important, they are not always seen as legitimate and democratic. So that's where we are. We're in a system in which we don't have a global governance or global polity that has any of the powers of sovereigns, and where we have on the dark side a loss of faith, um, on the bright side we have ongoing, including especially amongst the middle class and the educated in the developing world, as well as in the development community of the rich world, a big push, an increasing push, fueled by the internet and social media, of course, and empowered, in a sense, by that side of globalization, big push for a better global system. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for this initial sort of global level um, overview with both a dark and as well as a bright side and a, an open challenge. I would like to uh, invite Francesco to um, go next and give this also more uh, of a regional perspective, I think, in the two examples that you wanted to bring in. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. So, no, I, I wanted to make two points, um, but both of them are around the issue of the possibility of a virtuous circle between economic progress which we can think of in terms of poverty reduction, but we can also think of in terms of upward movements of people into the middle class, for example, and the growth of the middle class. Uh, uh, so b between the virtual circle between economic progress and uh, the growth of citizenship. And I want to use examples, one from uh, Latin America, where I think we begin to see evidence of that circle at work, and then uh, from the region that I'm now working mostly on, which is Africa, where I think we have a great need for that virtuous circle to kick in. So let me start with the Latin American uh, example. Uh, this uh, report that we worked on that, that Nancy kindly mentioned and to, to which she contributed, and in fact there was a parallel session earlier today where two of my co-authors, uh, Julian and Jamele, were, were presenting uh, some, of, some of that work. In the conclusion to that work, which we had uh, done two, two years ago or so, uh, we, we speculated on what the rise of the Latin American middle class might mean to the social contract in the region. 
Now, when economists talk about social contract, you should be suspicious. Uh, so let me tell you uh, what we meant in a very kind of narrow way about social contract. And it's a stylization, but I think it's a useful one. We described the Latin American social contract essentially in terms of a pact between the state and a society driven by elites, uh, which entailed basically a low tax, low quality public service equilibrium. So the elites say, okay, we'll pay low taxes, you the state take that little money, provide poor quality public services, and we the elite opt out from that. We send our kids to private school, we build, we buy uh, private power generators, even security forces, we may have our own private police and live in gated communities. Now, I'm stylizing, it's obviously not like that everywhere, um, but that's in some sense what we had in mind as a social contract in a highly unequal society uh, with relatively small states. We noted when we discussed that that two big exceptions to that were Brazil and Argentina, where, interestingly, the, uh, the, the equilibrium is more not so low tax, but still very poor uh, uh, public provision. So I, I don't know how, how that works. But then we speculated, we discussed the report uh, 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 documented a growth in the size of the Latin American middle class during the last decade, basically the period between 2002 and 2012, during which using the definition that we came up with, which was this, the one that Nancy mentioned, this four to, uh, sorry, this $10 a day to $50 a day being the middle class, um, there was an increase of, 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 of approximately 50%. So that's a very big increase. The middle class grew from around 20% of the population to around 30% of the population in the continent as a whole. So that an increase of 50% in, in a plausible definition of the middle class is, is surely non-trivial. And it was accompanied by a decline in poverty, which was also approximately 50%, from 45% of the population to 30% of the population. So we then speculated in the end of the report saying, will this change in the size and nature of this middle class uh, have any implications in terms of the social contract? Will the social contract be renegotiated? Will this new middle class, to put it very simply, continue to aspire to send their kids to private school and buy private policing, or will they say, we need better quality public services and we need to renegotiate the terms of the social contract with the state? The reason I bring this up is because I think since then we've seen two historical events which suggest that actually, at <coughs> least in some countries, the latter option is happening. The, the new middle class is actually interested in renegotiating the social contract. And those two events are the Brazilian protests of about a year ago when suddenly the country went to the streets uh, with a, an apparently vague and diffuse agenda. They were asking for better hospitals. They were asking for uh, 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 better schools. They were saying, we don't want FIFA, uh, FIFA standard uh, stadia. We want FIFA standard uh, public services, public transport, and so on. <laughs> And there was little to unify the thread across those protests, except, in my view, this kind of clamor uh, for better services. And I think it's now widely accepted. My, my, country, my countryman, I don't know what he'll think about that later, but I think it's widely accepted that those protests were not actually run by predominantly poor Brazilians. They were initiated, certainly, by middle class. Brazilian. So I think that was one example. The other example is the uh, prolonged student protests for uh, better quality and more affordable uh, public education, particularly university education in Chile. So these are two examples uh, of movements uh, of citizenship strengthened by this kind of newer middle class, uh, you know, asking for, 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 better, for better services. So I see that as an example of where some economic improvement empowered a group of people to exert, uh, you know, a greater degree of citizenship. I mean, of course, in these countries, people vote as well, so they, they express their citizenship in many ways, but I think those social movements and protests were an example of that. And I'd like to contrast that a little bit with what I see as... Um, a, a somewhat uh, uh, more of a lack of that process happening in Africa, the region I'm working on now. Uh, and there I want to, to say that's, that's a, a continent that has had actually fairly dramatic uh, uh, economic progress in the last 10, 15 years. Actually, we are now in the 20th year of sustained economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa. 
you know, we, we were told not to have PowerPoint. If I'd had one slide to show you, I would, have said, I would have shown a slide that has GDP per capita, real GDP per capita, on average in Latin America, uh, in Africa, rather, sorry. And it rises from 1960 to the mid-70s. It falls pronouncedly from 1976 to around 94, and then rises again fairly steeply until now. So if you go to conferences on Africa now, the predominant theme is Africa rising. You know, Africa is growing. GDP grew by GDP grew by four and a half percent between 1995 and 2012. There is progress, but when you look at what that's doing to poverty, uh, poverty is falling. It is falling, but it's falling very slowly. So between 1990 and 2010, East Asia uh, in 1990, East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa started at exactly the same level of poverty at a dollar 25 a day, which was around 56 percent of the population. 56 percent. East Asia reduced that by 44 percentage points to around 12, and Sub-Saharan Africa reduced it by 8 percentage points to around 48, 49 percent. Okay? So this is what economists refer to as a low growth elasticity of poverty, meaning that there's growth, but it's not translating into as much poverty reduction as we would like. Some of that is because the growth that everybody's excited about is in GDP terms. Africa still has by far the highest rate of population growth in the world. So when you look at per capita, it's much less. Uh, but the other part is Latin America is more unequal than Africa, but Africa has a lot of inequality, and it has inequality in levels and in changes. So some of the growth is, is unequal, right? And some of it, and this is what really worries me, and with that I will, I will end my, my initial intervention, and some of it is increasingly driven by natural resource um, extractive activities. So Africa is not only intensive in natural resources, but it's increasingly so in that there's a lot of new discoveries, right? And those sectors generate a lot of GDP growth, but their linkages to the broader economy are, of course, much smaller. So you can have the risk of this dualistic development. So the agenda that we are trying to push now from my little office within the bank is one of making Africa's growth more inclusive by two basic things, by bringing uh, you know, promoting growth in the places and sectors where the poor are, which must inherently involve agriculture to a large extent, but increasingly urban services as well. And the other is social protection and promotion systems that harness the growth that takes place elsewhere, including in the oil and diamonds and gold and mining sectors, and actually considers redistribution as an option in Africa. Uh, and it'll be interesting later to hear from Nancy and others about the experience, because my own experience is that Africa is now, in, in, in their attitudes to cash transfers, in a similar place to where uh, we were in Latin America 20 years ago, where we see them as handouts that are unproductive. I think Latin America has evolved in that sense, but Africa less so. So uh, that's you know, a virtuous circle that is working in Latin America and one that I hope will uh, work better in Africa, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I can already think of a couple of questions, but I will hold them for the time being. But thanks very much for uh, starting as an economist and saying we should be suspicious of that, uh, but then being quite political about what you were actually uh, bringing to the table, I think especially this issue of whether the new middle class will want to renegotiate the social contract. Uh, I'm a not. bit schizophrenic. So. <laughs> okay, well, uh, most economists are, uh, I hear from... Uh, <laughs> uh, but I would see that in this, uh, uh, at, at this point as a good thing, in the sense that at least you look at different perspectives. Uh, so I would... Uh, moreover, you did your PowerPoint anyway, even though you didn't have the opportunity to do it on the, on the screen. Um, and you already referred, in a way, to the next uh, speaker, Adrian, as uh, your countryman. Uh, perhaps it is not a pure coincidence that we have two Brazilians uh, in this panel, which is about citizenship, uh, because, of course, lots of the debate and, and examples that we often use uh, come from that context. With that, I would like to give the floor to Adrian. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, first, I would like to, to say a brief comment on citizenship and the concept of citizenship. We can use broad concepts of citizenship, and I think that there has been a trend to use broader conceptions of citizenship. Uh, so citizenship is, has been appearing with lots of different substantives or other issues. So it's uh, global inequality and citizenship, environmental and citizenship, and almost every single problem that humanity has has been related with citizenship. Uh, 
I'm not sure this kind of uh, normative inflation of the concept is useful. So, and here I'm using a, a, a nice formulation by Will Kimlicka. Uh, I rather, uh, I rather prefer a more restrict conception of citizenship. Uh, somehow it's a classical one. I, I rather understand citizenship as a bundle of rights to which anyone is entitled and one specific polity. And by polity we normally mean uh, national states, although the recent transformations in Europe actually are changing that. But still, we are meaning uh, polities, specific polities. Uh, obviously, citizenship has a second dimension, which is the citizen practices, uh, the actual citizen practices exercise to meaningful use that uh, citizenship. And uh, the idea of bringing practices obviously corrects some more classical understandings of, of, of uh, citizenship just as a given, uh, as something that actually is just a set of rights. It's more than a set of rights, it's a set of rights, but uh, also the way those rights are used, the practices that they are actually in place in different, in different countries. And, um, Although in any given moment, uh, citizenship is a bundle of rights, uh, then it's a given, there's a political story behind that, a wonderful political story of struggles that actually is it's the cause of these of this rights. So saying that, when we think in emerging forms of citizenship, we may be uh, meaning two different things. It can be uh, that there had been changes on the bundle of rights, or changes in the practices, or changes in both. And actually, in the last 30 years in the world, I would say there have been changes in both, in the bundle of rights and in the way citizens exercise their citizenship. And just let me mention two brief examples uh, outside of Brazil, but uh, almost everywhere we, we have become more aware, more s sensible to what we can say uh, or call cultural inequalities. So by mid-century, mid-20th century standards, cultural inequalities were common and they were no, not an issue. But now we have rights, uh, specific rights for minority groups that actually are telling us lots of things about how our sensibility towards inequality changed. Because on the one hand, we are very sensible to uh, these kinds of cultural inequalities, but on the other hand, we became quite insensible to economic inequalities. So economic inequalities have been grow growing, and we, there's, it's not a big issue. I mean, not as, uh, there's no a big consensus that we shouldn't stand that. Well, there's a big consensus that we shouldn't stand cultural inequalities. So that's a shift, and that changed the way citizenship has been exercised in different places. We have lots of movement movements reclaim, claim, making claims on differences, while making claims on <coughs> redistribution has become more difficult. You know? um, so I'm primary work on uh, participatory institutions in Brazil, and I would say that participatory institutions actually have changed the way citi political citizenship is, is exercised in Brazil. And uh, I say that they are part of the citizenship because participatory institutions in Brazil are there by mandate. So are part of the rights of regular citizens. Not all citizens actually use those institutions. Uh, they have some selection bias, but still they are part of the bundle of rights that is now in place in, in, in Brazil. So uh, those institutions are making two different changes, two interesting changes to the way citizens relate to policy. And our traditional understanding of policy, citizens choice politicians and politicians decide policies and then citizens could shape policies uh, as a complaint way of dealing with that, to complaint systems. But the participatory institutions we have now in Brazil actually changed the role of citizens in relation to policies because citizens became policy makers and uh, agents of policy accountability which is something quite uh, institutional agents of policy accountability, which is some, something quite, uh, quite new. So just, give me, just let me give you a brief example of how this has been changing. Uh, 
uh, I would refer to councils. We have now in Brazil more than 30,000 councils in place. That means that at least there are four councils in each Brazilian municipality. We have 5,770 Brazilian municipalities. We have at least four councils in each one of those municipalities and up to 34, 35 types of councils. In those councils, there are citizens that are entitled to exercise functions of accountability of policies or deciding policies. And that's, that's new, so that's very interesting. Um, who are those actors? And I would finish with, uh, with that. Uh, those actors are a mix of what Nancy is calling, accurately calling, uh, strugglers and middle classes. So we, we, do, we do have strugglers in there, uh, but we mainly have middle classes activists. You know? So the, the main of those people who are actually engaged in those spaces are middle class activists, uh, people from NGOs, uh, what Fernando Henrique Cardoso called once in a very, uh, we say, fortunate sentences, a new enlightened class. So a new social group that is actually aware of policies. This, this kind of social knowledge was not common 30 years ago in Brazil, and now there's classes, social classes, new social, social groups with a good knowledge of, about policies. Um, so how about the rest? How about ordinary citizens? Uh, well, I suppose that those ordinary citizens actually went into the streets in the protests of June uh, 2013 with different kinds of claims and with, uh, with different kinds of concerns, but I, I suppose that uh, Olivier could give us a more livelihood uh, or lively picture of that, that an academic that is normally searching for causes, and we are not still clear about the causes of those protests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also, um, Adrian very clear um, also about these insensitivities in some areas and sensitivities in, some, in other areas of how we look at citizenship and the issues of normative inflation of, of that concept. Now, when we uh, had our little preparatory meeting, uh, Olivier basically took the most difficult job upon himself because when I asked what do you want to talk about, he said, well, I will respond to what the others uh, have been saying. So he's been working hard, I hope, I think, uh, um, and he will now get his opportunity to say a few things from his perspective about what we are discussing. Olivier, the yeah. floor is yours. Yeah. yeah, first of all, thanking um, the organizer and the AADI to associate NGOs and civil society to this debate. I think we are in a critical moment as actors, NGOs, civil society. I'm talking here about organized civil society. I will make the differentiation with citizens' movements. Um, we, we are at a critical crossroad where we need to, to think, to rethink a little bit the roles and the, and the strategies we have developed over the last two decades. So to have this kind of contact with you, the people that are uh, bringing thinking and, uh, and analysis on, 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 on societies is absolutely critical for CSOs. And I think we can even improve the connection between our two worlds that are not enough connected from my experience uh, leading Concord for 11 years. Um, saying that, um, I, I, I relatively agree with almost everything I've heard until now in this panel, so I, I need to, to really uh, look for a little bit more kind of clivant uh, issues if we want to have a, a, a debate. But perhaps to start with um, an important statement to start with. We, we, we might celebrate the emergence and the increasing role of citizens' movements, organizations across the globe, but at the same time, um, more grassroots research and analysis, like the one provided by Civicus, uh, shows that civil society space, political space and right for assembly, for meeting, for uh, doing watchdogs vis-a-vis -vis their governments is shrinking down everywhere on the planet. In Europe, in the US, all over the world, rich and poor. So this space, which seems to be assumed by all of us as a kind of de facto 
reality is in danger. And this civil society index, which is produced by Civicus every year, shows clearly the struggle. And uh, the UN, as a reaction also of this situation, has appointed, uh, for the first time ever, a UN rapporteur on civil rights, civil uh, rights of assembly, etc., civil society organization. Huh? That, that, that's new, and we should look at that reality as well. What we call also a little bit technically the enabling environment for civil society organization. So here there is danger. Now, we are in a, in a period where I think we are living uh, several tensions as, as a civil society, and I will list them very quickly, hopefully to provoke debate later on with you. Um, there is this traditional tension between organized civil society, and within that, the, the core of this sector are NGOs, traditional NGOs, and some of them global, and with the emerging new citizen movements. And I think we are realizing, very frustrated, we have observed over the last three, four years that all those citizen movement, mobilization, middle class reaction, demands for new social contracts are emerging totally outside the traditional organized NGOs. Totally outside. And we are even not welcome to, to join or to just participate to their ongoing uh, um, whatever protest or discussion. So it's, 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 it has been very hard to accept that as, as formal organized NGO, traditional NGOs. The second tension is about this uh, strategy uh, for change. We are supposed to be ag agent for change, actor of change, um, between incremental change that we try to promote through policy, engagement, dialogue within, with, I, I, I was saying with institution, and then I think within institution because it's, the border is now totally disappearing, so we are from within the system trying to push for incremental change, and now we, we might not share unanimously the same uh, kind of diagnostic, but most of us are totally frustrated looking back 20 years. Uh, so we did everything institution were expecting us to do, and if we look at the effect of it, it's absolutely frustrating. So some leaders from civil society are saying, stop losing your time and your resources from within the system and go for much more transformative, radical agenda, and I'm happy to come back on that later. Another tension is between this tradition, which is in a way still post-colonial, which is to have thought global actors, huh? NGOs, in some ways, the one we, we talk about, international development NGOs, humanit uh, humanitarian NGOs for sure, but also some environmental NGOs, human rights NGOs, have been created from a global perspective, with a global strategy. They projected themselves directly from wherever they have been created into a global agenda. And this is totally challenged by the new uh, movement emerging from local struggles, uh, what we call the translocal movements. And just to illustrate from my country, I'm French, Alternativa, which is a movement that emerged from the uh, ashes of Copenhagen negotiations, with the frustration we all know about climate negotiation. And some people say, stop engaging in this climate negotiation. We should stop. We might not need even government to commit to reducing emission, gas emission, because if we manage to mobilize 30% of society from the bottom, that will accept on their own citizen responsibility to reduce 30% the gas emission, you don't need any more government to agree on anything. And that's how Alternativa, which is creating a buzz right now in France on climate agenda, has been emerging 10 months ago, creating a real kind of uh, secousse and earthquake in our traditional, again, NGO sector. WSF, World Social from Fatigue, I think it's, uh, it's uh, clearly at the, at the core also of the new reflection from civil society. There, there was a momentum very linked to our Brazilian colleagues' energies and impetus. And now that the World Social Forum moved out of Brazil, we observe a problem. Huh? The, the, the African version of World Social Forum didn't manage to articulate a, a, as strong agenda as it was during the Bra Brazilian time. Very um, in line with what Nancy said about this missing political space at global level. I, 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 I put it as a political space. You talk about this lack of uh, uh, global institutional governance, uh, 
Well, it's really a political space which is missing. Uh, it's still very, all the international agenda is led by intergovernmental organizations, by our member states, and this prevents global citizens to engage in a global political space with other actors, with businesses, with other stakeholders to create politics at a global level. And this is really one of the main uh, challenges for the future. And finally, uh, perhaps to talk about the broken stories, we are identifying that the whole model, we are building our current work, and I'm sure some of you as well, is really based on broken stories. The one of charity, the one yesterday, Dirk Messner was mentioning this uh, uh, old uh, post-colonial approach on development of North South, etc. So all those broken stories are, re are calling for reinviting a new narrative, which is a big issue for civil society those days. And we cannot do it alone, I guess. We might need your um, also inputs into this uh, work. Uh, final, final comment. And I'm happy to come back to more solution-oriented point in the second part of the discussion, because they are very interesting initiatives. But is the, I missed a little bit the discussion about, and again, back from Latin America, it has been obvious over the last 10, 15 years, the problem of democracy. What is also very questioned in, in this current discourse on development is not so much the economical dimension. The social contract was very interesting the way you put it, but at the core of it, there is a, a strong questioning of the representative democracy system that works so well in Europe, but everywhere else it doesn't work. And even in Europe, French people last week were saying that they are just sick about the current system. We know that France is very centralized, <laughs> but by the way, it clearly states that what people are calling all over the world, it's an other kind, and not to be consulted just consulted. They want to be part of the decision-making process. And this needs really, I think, a, a re-engineering of our democracy everywhere. I stop there. A lot on the plate, but happy to take these challenges because I think we were in a comfort zone for 20 years, and that's the right time for NGOs to come and to reinvent themselves. Thank you very much. Very well done, and not an easy task. And you've also been able to squeeze in a number of your own points that you wanted to make anyway, I'm sure. Um, I want to take up uh, one, what I think is one of your main points, Olivier, and throw it back at Nancy, um, and then also see how you would respond to that. And then after that, I would like to get Francisco and Adrian involved in another question that is in the back of my mind, and then to open it up uh, for the audience in both the Twitter way uh, as well as the uh, conventional method. Um, my question to Nancy is, if, if you hear Olivier talk about these um, local initiatives, more radical, um, um, that even also organized civil society, traditional NGOs have lost some of their credibility in a sense. You talked about the loss of faith in states. And uh, as, as the part of your dark side, uh, while at the same time you say, well, the challenge is that we need some, something at the global level that provides us with norms, um, legitimacy. How do you see that happening in a situation where there is so much uh, a sense of fragmentation and that uh, we often, if, if I listen to the examples, also I think Adrian's example in a sense, that there is such a lack, it seems, of a common sense of the upscaling of these kinds of initiatives to that level? Um, or do you see it more as something that could be established top-down at the global level? Could you elaborate on that? And then I would like to ask Olivier to respond to that response. Uh, maybe I can answer the, your question indirectly by saying that I I don't agree with something Olivier said or implied about the role of the intergovernmental institutions. Mm -hmm. He said they're controlled by sovereigns and that they are not an effective vehicle for globally aware citizens to um, express their demands for changes in rules and norms. I did say that 
there's a sense that these institutions are not sufficiently legitimate, representative, democratic. At the same time, if you think about a place like the World Bank, which we do in Washington, and where I used to work as, and where I have worked for people like Chico on research issues. Well, let me tell another story besides the story about AIDS as a way to answer the question. In the US, there is a Congress. It holds hearings. There are private witnesses. Some years ago, I was a witness giving testimony at one of these hearings that was looking at um, the U.S. approach to economic, or the World Bank and other international, how should the U.S. affect the way the World Bank speaks on health policy issues in Africa? At the hearing was the leader of an African NGO, an inter-country, quasi-regional NGO in Africa. This NGO representative is using, in the best sense of the word, the democratic system in the US to influence, to have the US Congress tell the US Treasury, which represents the US at the World Bank, to tell the World Bank an intergovernmental system in which the US plays perhaps a disproportionate role, so it's not a great example, but to say something to the World Bank about the question of user fees in health clinics and hospitals in Africa. Now, that to me is an example of a case where the World Bank is actually more porous more responsive, potentially, because of this system grounded in democracy in one of the advanced economies that is a member, than is necessarily the government of the representative who came from Zambia to the needs of, glo of citizens in Zambia. It's a complicated world. That's what I mean by mixed coalitions. I think we need more of these intergovernmental institutions that are more responsive to NGOs and to citizen activism. You know, I, I don't think that the civil society movements of the world should despair that it doesn't work to, to operate within that institutional system. I, did I answer your question? I think you did. <laughs> and I look forward to Olivier's response or reaction to this plea yeah. Again, based on this um, experience of doing advocacy and engagement with institutions in Europe at international level, I think our frustration is kind of too wide. One, on, on the one hand, um, if we want to challenge, as you have been doing for the last two days, from what I understood from the debate I've been part of, uh, challenging the kind of old paradigm, uh, we see that the intergovernmental international setting works when you are part of the rich countries. So the World Bank, the, 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 the shareholders, who are more than stakeholders for the case of the World Bank, but uh, the, the Security Council, the, all the important bodies, even the EU today, the European Union, is mainly managed by the member states. Yeah? And when it comes to international, Europe, US, uh, the, the, the big big players are there to, in a way, decide whatever agenda they want. So it's very difficult for Zambian government to demonstrate to its own civil society uh, that he can, as government, leverage anything at international level. And, and this is a constant struggle for us NGOs. The G77 is trying to reinvent itself these days around the post-2015 agenda with absolutely no means, no voice, no access, even less access than some INGOs, which is a scandal for some southern countries that have less access to the negotiators and the Secretary General Office of the UN than uh, some of us. So this is one of the struggles. Who is part of the leading force of this intergovernmental? And the second problem is the nature 
of intergovernment, which is always government representative. We don't believe anymore that governments represent societies. And, and we are not alone. The business have shown that uh, much earlier, that they do not consider that everything should go when it comes to whatever national, local, global discussion through the government representation. And, and I think we are now reaching a point where we do not we don't say that we don't need states, we don't say, but we consider that they are one of the stakeholders in society and that the, a new democratic system needs to be built around multi-stakeholders and not just a bottleneck made by institutional representative with the legitimacy we don't question about election, etc., but which is not enough, enough anymore and not efficient anymore to solve the problem of the real citizens in real lives. Okay, thank you very much. I, th I think the, uh, the different positions are, rel are clear. Um, and I hope that this invites uh, further questions also from uh, the audience. But before we go there, I first wanted to um, raise one more uh, issue around the question of the social contracts uh, and to um, direct that at Francesco and Adrian. Um, where and when do you think citizens are new citizens, your new middle classes, uh, are more likely to uh, demand a new kind of social contract, not taking for given the kind of uh, situation that you have explained? And how is that linked to selective sensitivities in the sense that what Adrian explained about how the economic dimensions were deprioritized in a sense. Uh, and while on the social side, there was also an element of cooptation, I think is, is one of the elements that you also brought in, um, which would perhaps make activism less effective in some ways. How, how would you look at that, uh, Francis? So I just want to make sure I understood. You're saying when these uh, movements will will arise, is that, is that what you're Well, asking? when they are more likely to actually demand uh -huh. a higher level social contract in, in your terminology. Well, I mean, this is a hypothesis. I don't really know the answer, but my hypothesis is it's when there is an economic slowdown after a period of rapid growth. And mm -hmm. the reason that I say that is that a period of rapid growth promotes the enlargement of these more vocal groups, right? So that's the Latin American example again, if, you're, if, you, if you think about that. Um, that's, of course, you know, uh, I don't know anything about Chinese activism, and I'm sure that uh, Olivier and uh, Adrian may know, uh, may know some. They certainly know more than me. But, you know, we see a growth in online communities and, and, and you know, social action in China, which is hard to think would have been there in the absence of the enormous progress and urbanization that took place economically. Now, these processes generate a growth in aspirations. And then when the economy slows down after that, um, you have, you know, those aspirations become frustrated and that leads to, uh, to I think, to a problem. So I, again, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm throwing out various hypotheses which are not particularly substantiated about the Brazilian protests, but I think that's a little bit of what you saw is you saw, a, you know, a slowdown in the Brazilian economy and then all of these people who were saying, okay, but, w w you know, now we don't, we don't want to go back to where we were. We, 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 we have higher aspirations, and, we, and, and that, I think, generates frustration. I think that also lies behind the incredible fear that the Chinese leaders have of allowing any growth slow down. I think they maintain social stability in China. You know, their social contract is, we keep delivering you 7%, 8%, 9% growth, and you let it, leave us alone to rule the place as we see fit. And I think that may break down if the growth sl slows down. Now, I wonder if you will give me one second or um, two minutes to say something about the global institutions and the World Bank as well, that, that we were having this, this, this conversation. Yeah. And two I minutes, thought it, two minutes is fine. Yes, yeah. one second is a bit too. Yeah, too one yeah. second wouldn't work. That's why I said two minutes. So, uh, what I, I just want to, you know, Nancy's uh, thoughts on that are very interesting. And it made me think, first of all, of the contrast between two influential works by John Rawls, right, a philosopher that I'm mm -hmm. sure will be familiar to all of you. And you know, so in, in, we tend to think of John Rawls as being a great force for equality because we tend to think of a theory of justice, right, where he has the difference principle in a theory of justice, which says that inequalities are acceptable only to the extent that they are to the benefit of the worst off. 
what economists call the maximin principle, and philosophers refer to, as he did, to the difference principle. But of course, again, as is probably known here, Rawls also wrote The Laws of the Peoples, that Law of the Peoples, in which he said that those kind of maximin arguments do not extend to the international uh, 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 arena. He says no justice responsibility, no responsibility in the sense of justice from rich, the citizens of rich countries, like I think most of you in this audience, to the citizens of, 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 of poor countries. And there's a, a very strong debate going on in that. But his argument for that was that he said there is no accountable uh, international polity. Okay? So I, I thought I'd, I'd remind all of us of, of that because actually in his view, which is an influential view, um, if there were a system like the one that I think Nancy was, was asking for, actually perhaps that would even change the sort of normative basis. You know, there could become, there could come into being a social contract between rich and poor places, which in Rawls's view and in practice do not exist at the moment. Um, that, that's w one thought. On the World Bank, I mean, two fundamental reasons why it's nowhere near being that sort of institution one is what Nancy's already pointed to, and others also, that we're unaccountable. Uh, and, and, that, and that unaccountability or limited accountability in democracy has, in my view, two dimensions. One is between countries. So Nancy already referred to the fact that the U.S. is perhaps excessively influential. So are a number of European countries. In the IMF, the European yeah. countries are probably more of a problem than the U.S. Yeah. is. Okay? But developing countries have much less influence over the way it's run. The other problem which I'll just mention briefly, I could talk for hours about it, but I'll just mention very briefly, <laughs> is what I call incumbent bias. So if you ask a bunch of, you know, I don't know, economists, chief economists, lead economists, whatever you have it, uh, we'll say, look, the client is the people in the poor countries, okay? But in practice, of course, we don't deal with the people directly. We deal primarily with governments. And there are a number of incentive reasons why that generates within the institution a bias towards whoever happens to be in government at the time. And that, of course, in a situation where the political economy is very complicated, presents a real problem. So that just is you know, probably very familiar to all of you, but a reason why the World Bank is still so very, very far away from being anything like what I, I think we would need. Okay, thank you very much. Adrian. <laughs> well, I very much agree on something that Olivia Chess has just said, uh, and actually was somehow linked to the idea of, of how we use the concept of, of citizenship, because most of our political concepts for historical reasons are meant to be used in national contexts. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's a bundle of rights, you have a state, and then you have a system of a system of institutions that actually allows you to have leverage. Yep. Uh, while at the international level we have uh, strong problems and that is why uh, even equalitarian liberalism as the one of, of roles stops at at the borders and say we don't have how to deal with that at the international level. Obviously there's the cosmopolitan uh, tradition trying to say we, we should to stake to human rights and if you stake to human rights then there's no borders, because humans are humans and that's it. But that's, that's an ongoing uh, debate. Uh, but still, the concept of, of citizenship at that level, it doesn't help, help a lot, because you don't have the institutions to actually uh, leverage the pressures, although you, you obviously have international activism and you obviously have transnational social movements, and they have been amazingly important, and I agree with Nancy on, on, on that. There are several changes that we can't explain without those, those uh, social actors at transnational level. So the second, the second brief comment I want to make, it's, it's on cooptation. I, I wouldn't say that those institutions are actually cooptating or making cooptation of social actors. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a bit more complex, and it's, uh, it's a kind of, uh, it has, good side and bad side. Um, so on the one hand, Brazilian state has become amazingly porous or permeable to social interests because of those institutions, because of the way the PT uh, was embedded in social movements. And so there was an opportunity and it's an opportunity that is a result of political struggle. So it's not a given. They, they fought for that. They opened room. And then you have a place for actually making policy. And actually, that's exactly what they have been asking for. So you, you, if you can decide policy, why you should be protesting? 
I mean, you protest because you can decide on important things, but if you have the space for doing that, why should be on the street? Mm -hmm. So that space was opened, and we have been with those spaces for the last 30 years in Brazil, and there have been amazing changes on the one hand. But on the other hand, those spaces demand lots of social energy and lots of investment of all those actors. And if you go to those spaces, actually, you can't be doing several other things at the same time. So it affects the way social actors relate with grassroots, but it's a trade-off. Uh, and June protests is a clear example of that. Those mm -hmm. younger generation of, 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 of middle classes, and I agree with the, the characterization she could just made, uh, are not linked to participatory institutions. They don't know, even know that those exist. But I mean, there's a generational gap, and we need to invent other institutions for dealing with that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have a number of major issues on the table, um, and I would like to open it up for questions. I got a signal that already some tweets have started to come in. I already have two people here who've started to raise their hands several times. Let me first give the floor to the first person who actually did so. The microphone is right behind you, right yes. Thank you. A comment and a question. The comment is on uh, who runs the international institutions. When we did our multi-volume history of the UN and asked really what had influenced what had happened, we thought there were three UNs. There's the UN of governments, much less powerful in many areas, perhaps less in the bank, perhaps more in the bank and so forth, but in the UN much less powerful than the second UN which is the staff members, and the third UN, which is all sorts of people around the UN, the NGOs, perhaps experts, and so forth. I think that may be a very important point. But secondly, my question, no one has mentioned the media, and I'd like to hear from the panel how media relates, sets a frame of understanding or distortion of understanding for citizenship, <laughs> and how that ties in with inequality. Because what I see, at least in the countries I know, enormous dominance of the media and distortion from the top 1%. Thank you. Okay. Let me collect a few more questions. Yes, and then you, and you, and then that's the last one in this round. Right. Um, so one, two, three, after the lady here. Yeah, yes. thank you very much. I wanted to uh, raise the issue of citizenship and to say that a way of looking is also a way of not looking. Because in a sense, citizenship uh, is tied in, as you say, to the right holders vis-a-vis -vis the state. But in many countries, uh, who form the citizens? The, uh, these are people with papers, those with legal rights. And in many of our countries, even the statistical system uh, mm. uh, are not there to provide the civil registration, to provide the uh, civil statistics that give you a legal identity. So, that, that, uh, so many people are indeed excluded. Um, uh, secondly, you have a situation where the state defines itself as what type of a state. And if you look at now what's going on, say even in Myanmar, they're excluding the Rohingyas. Uh, and the senses of trying to define and to codify identities have created a tremendous violence vis-a-vis -vis the, the minority groups, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, religion and so on. So it's a redefinition of what the state would take into account as what goes into the social contract. And, and finally, uh, the whole issue of uh, illegal migration, uh, the, the, the moving population, the, 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 uh, the refugees, the, the, the breakdowns, and people living in different states and not being able to claim rights. So if we are to look at inequalities, I think, and the renegotiation of the social co uh, contract, and who forms the global uh, citizens and what type of global social contract that we have. It is how I wanted to ask this very thoughtful panel, how do you deal with these very complex issues? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Does the panel think we can absorb three more questions before I give you a chance? Okay. Uh, yes, you were next and you are after that. Yes, wow, and the gentleman the with the hat is the last one in this round. Yes. Uh, so two things. I know that we're primarily talking about citizenship in relation to the state, but I come from a country where corporations are people. 
the United mm. States. <laughs> and what about civic, what about corporate citizenship? What yeah. I've seen is that over the last 30 years, a continuing externalization of the cost of social reproduction and also externalization of environmental risk. So look at fracking companies and oil companies. It's a it seems to be a socialization of, of risks and bads and a privatization of the profit from these types of things, which actually affects the type of services that the government can give the, the, uh, you know, the citizens and vice versa, and bringing these people into, or these entities into the discussion about, well, citizenship and equality, et cetera. So what about corporate citizenship, especially since in the U United States they are people? Um, another thing about the uh, the lack of interest in some uh, social movements to deal with NGOs, international NGOs, and the idea that when you look at particular issues, you see partnership, but you look at larger issues, you don't. And I'm wondering if they're as, op if they're as open as they, they think they are. So I would say that for reforms is one thing, but revolution, or not revolution, but structural change is something different. So is there space at the World Bank, Adi Adi, at the Center for Global Development to talk about post-capitalist development and okay. what that might mean. Yeah. And can we even have some of these things we're talking about without addressing capital, not capital just money, but process of creation and accumulation and what that means. Why can't we say this? I know if I say it, I feel like I'm gonna get the cold shoulder, someone's gonna give me Fra Francis Fukuyama's book about the end of history or et cetera. So the thing is, is that is there a place for honest discussion? Because I would seem that we sell, people would self-censor and think that there's certain things that are just off the table that aren't for, up for discussion. And that would be one of them. So I just would leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Um, this gentleman here is, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the gentleman with the hat is the last one in this round. Thank Please. you. Uh, Jason from the University of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. Um, I'd like to perhaps link my question with uh, the first question on especially conflict areas. and. and there are a lot of them in, in certainly in Africa. And the whole notion of stateless citizens, what's what's their role? Who do they bargain with? For what purpose? They do they have even any space for collective bargaining? I think some of those questions uh, maybe could be answered. The second is a point that unlike in Latin America, I do not agree with the view that um, that there's a possibility for the middle class to do a lot of social bargaining, especially through your protests and so on. Um, the experience in Africa, in my view, suddenly has been very different. That people who go on the streets are not, they are not the middle class. That's your, your poorer class. And there are very subtle ways in which the middle class in Africa tends to bargain with the state. But I, I, I'm not quite sure if it's as homogeneous or whether it's very clear. But again, those are issues that perhaps we could discuss about. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Joshua. I'm from the University of Leeds. Uh, I've heard all the discussions, but how do we achieve or improve responsible development without, first of all, a transformation in the political and democratic uh, bodies, not just uh, the Global South government, but also in the governance of the Global North, and most especially uh, agencies like World Bank, uh, UN and IMF. How do we achieve that without, first of all, democratizing the process which decisions are made, not just being dictated by just a group of countries? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, Adrian, there were quite a few points that actually came in your court. Would you like to pick up two of them? Well, yeah, thank you. Let me address at least one or two of them. Um, well, the, the idea of citizenship, uh, it, doesn't imply, it doesn't imply that once you have the bundle of rights, the rights are going to be actually in place. So there's a tension, and that is why the, the concept of citizenship also contains the idea of practices, because it's not just about what is written in the Constitution, it's about how citizens relate with that. And in places where those rights granted by constitution are not actually in place, which is most of the countries of the southern hemisphere, there are citizens are allowed to do certain things because those rights are in the constitution. 
which is very different from trying to struggle for something that has not a constitutional state. Mm -hmm. If you have a constitutional state, you, can, you, you have lots of options, and maybe you wouldn't be successful, but it wouldn't be as hard as trying to put a new thing in the agenda or a new thing in the constitution. So that is why um, it's, it's a mix of the bundle of rights with the kind of practices are actually in place uh, exercised by citizens to try to have or make the access of those rights effective or meaningful. Uh, and um, that's, that's, that's the history of, of, of Latin America. That's the, the whole argument of, Jim, or, or, of Holston about emergency, uh, emergent citizenship. So you have the rights, you move and do something with that, and that gives you leverage. Uh, I, I, I would deal with the, the idea of how the social contract could be negotiated in a, in a slightly different way, um, which is an unexpected consequence uh, of the rise of our sensibility uh, towards cultural inequalities. So in the, in the case of Brazil, for example, you have a, a set of new rights recognizing cultural differences. And because those rights actually allow people to get mobilized, people are handling to, to put under the label of cultural rights this redistributional demands, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. So the demands are not presented as distribution per se, but as a right which you are entitled because you are black, because you are a woman, because you are Kaisara, who is someone who, is, who belongs to a community of, of fishermen. And so because you have this specific, this specific cultural specificity, you have access to certain benefits. But actually, there are distributional benefits. But that's the way they can use this new, new frame. And there has been ch important changes in Brazil. So just to give you a figure, now we have more black people in the census than we used to have. And the natality rate is exactly the same, so there's no more new black people being born. It's because you have new entitlements that actually let people to recognize themselves as blacks and to use that to change their way of life. So that's, that's the playing game of citizenship. Thank you very much. Uh, Olivier, I know you also want to pick up a few of these points. I also have one Twitter or tweet uh, question for you to add to the mix. Why is there resistance to tradi by traditional uh, CSO NGOs for new, uh, against new forms of contestation, especially if civil space is reducing? Yeah. Well, it will be perhaps an indirect um answer to that last point, but yeah. I, I wanted to, to, to come back. We, we have been discussing a lot about citizens in their protest expression, the, the, the more political dimension of citizen, an active citizen citizenship. But we shouldn't forget that side to side, there is the more active local engagement from citizens to just change their ecosystem, to, to, to concretely address the problems of a group, of a neighborhood, of with an interlocution with an institution, whatever. And, and this is within a, a European network called Smart CSOs, that I invite you to, to consult perhaps through internet, Smart CSOs. We have been working actively over the last three years about how to build uh, a new narrative, i will come back to that uh, necessity for a post-capitalist kind of uh, vision of a, of a good society, um, need to be based on the millions of seeds which are made by practice, action, very concrete innovation that civil society experiment all over the world. You can take the most difficult sub-region of a country with civil war and you will find citizens, women, men that are actively solving concrete situation and problems. And, and this is, we believe, the, the seeds. The problem is to scale up. How do we bring those um, bubble of excellence, that's the way I, I look at it, into the system, into the regimes, into the institutions, how they manage to influence policy change, but major policy change, not incremental change. 
So this is a, a, a big issue, and I just wanted to show you, even if it will be just for you a color print painting, but this is a one-page chart that tried to describe precisely from the so-called M, uh, 15M, of, uh, the, the Indignados movement in Spain, 15M, uh, how these protests that have been firstly a protest, a sitting, a sitting uh, during several months, you might remember, in Spain, blocking Madrid center, how this trickled down into concrete action and change in society, sector by sector. And that shows that even if media, back to your question, stop talking about the protest part the visible part of this citizenship engagement, it's still absolutely transforming part, part of the Spanish society. Uh, and for the one that knows a little bit about this Spanish context, the fact that six months ago they created a new party, Podemos, for the EU election that made four or six percent of the, that shows the impact that a protest can have when it comes back to the more local action-oriented work. And civil society is about both the political engagement and the action, and these links need to be always maintained. And finally, just thanking, I think, the, the person leaves, uh, unfortunately, but thanking the person that raised this question of citizens without uh, citizenship or people mm -hmm. without the right to, to exert their citizenship. I think uh, we should take it on board much more um, often in our own narrative as civil society to remember every time that there is increasingly part of the world population that has no right. And the migrants, just to end with the migrants example that uh, Madame raised, um, is incredible how the development sector, we here, have been co-opting, even within NGOs, the migrants organization. If I look in France, the, the, the umbrella for migrant organization is now part of the development umbrella organization not on the human rights sector, not on the more political part. We have more with this co-development, you remember, and, 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 and the banks, the development banks have been also this remittances kind of approach and the role that migrants can play back in their countries for co-development, etc. have in a way depoliticized the reality of those people, which is firstly a question of rights and access to political rights. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, I know you also wanted to pick on two or was it three issues here? <clears throat> it's a jumble. I'll, it's a jumble. I'll do my best to give you. <laughs> uh, I think it's been a really wonderful conversation. I wanted to say something as an economist about the idea of citizenship, that in addition to a bundle of rights, <clears throat> the way we think of it in economics, I believe, is that citizens of their countries, and I would say globally aware citizens of the world, have responsibilities as well as a bundle of rights. At the national level, those responsibilities are captured in the, in the tax-paying arena. And one of the great challenges for us as globally aware citizens is that most people in the developing world are too poor to finance the public goods in their countries, that it is when there is a larger middle class that it becomes more possible to, for people to exercise that responsibility to be financing as well as taking rights but providing responsibilities. And as globally aware citizens, we have a responsibility, particularly in the development community, to think about the problem of this, this group of strugglers I talked about who are too poor, really, still, too insecure to pay taxes, and yet they do. As I mentioned, they often pay high consumption taxes, particularly in countries that rely on consumption taxes because capital is mobile. So it's about more than rights. Uh, and the social contract is, is you need a tax system which allows people to make their governments accountable. So the responsibility is also to monitor their governments. And it's true at the global level too because we live in a system now in which decisions in one set of countries affect lives and citizenship and the rights uh, of people in other countries. 
Now, I just want to say about the American corporations, that's the dark side. But don't worry. We have now Piketty mania. <laughs> <laughs> and he is legitimizing the idea of a post-material, post-capitalist sort of system. And what's so interesting is that his main policy recommendation is a global tax. Mm. So I wanted to bring us you know, together those two points that I've just tried to make. Now, one more thing about the middle class in Africa. It's so small. If you use the points that I tried to make last night, that the middle class is secure. You have to think of it as people who are reasonably resilient against household shocks, against a change in the price of oil. If the bus fare changes in Brazil, it is the strugglers who are in trouble because they're paying high costs for lousy public transportation. And suddenly, it's not just 10% of their budget, it's 20% of their budget. So, you know, the middle class in Africa is too dependent still on the state. Most people in my middle class, more or less $10 and above, with some kind of health insurance and other safety net, rely on their civil servants, their officials in government, they're in the big NGOs that rely on outside money. If you go to Addis Ababa, you have a big middle class that's composed of people working for the UN institutions and the IMF and the World Bank and so on and so on. <laughs> Most people are poor in the absolute sense or struggling. So that's why Chico Francisco is saying he's worried that the social contract in Africa won't emerge. It won't be negotiated, let alone renegotiated. Finally, yes, the global institutions lack legitimacy. They're not democratic. Sovereign states are homes, hopefully, in most parts of the world, of democracy. And we haven't figured out a way to have that kind of democracy at the global level. <clears throat> but. We would have to reinvent them if we didn't have them, believe me. They are more open and, in a sense, more democratic than many of the world's nations. They provide a kind of indirect citizenship with rights and responsibilities to many, many people in the developing world. They're not perfect. They never will be. But even the UN has the third UN as Sir Richard pointed out. So <coughs> I think part of being a global citizen is to work to make them more legitimate as well as more effective. OK, thank you very much. Francesco. I'll be, I'll be very brief because, in a sense, Nancy's already um, helpfully kind of made the main point that I wanted to make, which was you know, your, your point about the, the middle classes in Africa. I mean, the, the point I was trying to make exactly about we don't yet have as much of that virtuous circle where economic progress for, uh, for the poor and the not so poor as they move up and then become more politically engaged and, 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 and active and you know, are able to, be, to exercise their citizenship rights. Um, that, ha that is not going uh, yet because the middle class is in some sense just too small. Now, you know, Africa is, as you know better than me, an enormously heterogeneous place. So this is not true of Mauritius, for example, or perhaps of Botswana. But it is true in most other places. There's an emerging middle class in Nigeria and Ghana and so on. But in many places, it's just simply too small. And there is this big polarization. Basically, the problem of elite capture, which is common, you know, across the developing world and in parts of the developed world as well, is all the more marked in, in Africa. The role of big corporations that was mentioned in the context of the United States also applies to Africa, particularly when they are, uh, you know, big international corporations that are very active in the natural resource sector and so on. So the, the, the political fabric is even thinner, uh, which is why I think we need, you know, that, that I don't know how, but it would be great to get that process to, to be, to be kick-started. 
I just wanted to say one word on, on the media question as well, and then reflecting back on, on the Brazil experience. Um, you know, one uh, example that's very well known from Brazil, of course, was the role of the media in pursuing the Mensalão scandal, right? So this was a scandal where the PT, the, the Labour Party, uh, which has been, on the whole, a force for inclusion and good, uh, but they had a, a, a big scheme, basically, whereby they bought the support of uh, parliamentarians from opposition parties in order to make a Congress that was very fragmented function. But this was, you know, I mean, deeply illegal uh, and, uh, and, you know, disruptive of institutions. I mean, they were basically buying parliamentarians through monthly payments. Now, this was pursued in the courts and ultimately people were, uh, were uh, tried, very influential people, you know, prob possibly at one point the second most influential person in the country uh, was, was, was prosecuted and convicted and they went to jail. I forget now, I don't know anymore if they are still in jail, but they, they yeah, yeah, went. Yeah. Not, uh, now this, ha in my view, my, uh, Adrian will know better, but in my view this only happened because of the media. If we didn't have an incredibly vibrant media, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Now, the media was necessary, it wasn't sufficient. The fact that the Supreme Court actually had some people that were you know, prepared to, to perform their roles was, was important. There are other examples too, I won't bore you with it, but one much smaller example, but an interesting one which I knew personally, was the design of Bosa Familia. The media played a role even in that, in that the minister uh, for the combat against hunger, as the ministry was called at the time, had very different ideas of what the zero hunger program should be. And there was a lively discussion in the Brazilian media at the time where a lot of Brazilian experts were quoted very heavily in the media criticizing what he wanted to do. And ultimately, people were able to persuade Lula directly to change that towards what later became Bolsa Familia. So even there, a media discussion uh, was important. So okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I think what I take from this at, at one level is, um, and Nancy's made that most explicit, I think we should be careful probably not to throw away the baby with the bathwater in terms of the institutions that we do have at local, national and global level are far from perfect, but we do not have easy alternatives at hand. And that attempts to actually try and make them work better still seem to be uh, very important and useful. And this is not only about state institutions, but I think the, the self-critical uh, dimension of, of the panel was also very clear in that this also applies within uh, civil society among uh, conventional NGOs. Uh, I could add this definitely also applies to uh, firms and their behavior. It applies basically to all societal actors that need to find ways to um, uh, come together on this, even though they have clearly different interests and uh, power issues are uh, at stake here. Now I'm at a sort of a dilemma, but I'm going to solve it very easily uh, because I think you have been very disciplined and attentive and um, um, participating actively. So I think you have deserved uh, another additional five minutes of space between this uh, dense uh, plenary and the lunchtime, which uh, officially starts at one o'clock. It's now seven minutes before one. And the other thing I could do is to start another round, but then we will go over time. And I don't think on the last day of such a, a conference as packed as, as the one that we have experienced uh, here, that would be a very sensible thing to do. So I would like to thank very much uh, all of you for participating, and especially, of course, our four great uh, panelists. Oh, but Olivier wants one communication, so I will allow that, given that we are ahead yeah, of schedule. Which is not to take benefit of being a speaker, but just because if you want to deepen this discussion in this afternoon, there is a session on global citizens <laughs> movement that's organized Concord in S34. So if some of you are interested to deepen and to challenge more and to be a little bit more in interaction with us, some, some people will talk about the different form of solidarities and global engagement. So very welcome, S34, 230 after the lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Let's end on a light note. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine.